How about if I just start at the beginning? <laughs> you could you could be honest. Because <laughs> you know what? They have the sweat equity that went into that memory that they're making with their friends and family. And that's what's important with us, and that's what the I Am Real World's about. Well, that's a great question. You know, one of the best things about a spring food plot is you get a second chance if it fails. Chasing Giants with Don Higgins. Brought to you by buyafarm.com, your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. By tapping into Don's years of experience, dedication, and commitment, Chasing Giants focuses on the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Now, here is Don and co-host Terry Peer. What's up, everybody? It's Chasing Giants, episode 85, brought to you by BuyFarm.com. October 3rd, Don Higgins, we can finally say that your deer season is open for the 2021 season. Yes, sir. I've been sitting in a tree, so uh, honey season's here. Yeah, we've uh, we've danced around this a little bit for the last 30 days. I got to start here in Kentucky about a month ago. And we learned last week that you were going to kick off your 2021 season in Iowa. So I know everyone's anxious on seeing that. I believe on Friday opening day, I saw a social media post from you from the tree with your camera arm and your Matthews bow uh, in Iowa. Why don't you give us a little bit of rundown about how that went this weekend? Well, the main reason I went to Iowa is I had – cameras scattered all over the eastern half of the state and uh, I wanted to gather some of those up and and uh, concentrate on one area basically the farm where I initially got permission and uh, so I gathered up those cameras on Thursday and then uh, Friday opening day I hunted the Friday afternoon I just went for a drive Friday morning you know I don't like to hunt the opening for October mornings too bad so I just Kind of went for a ride about daylight, and uh, then I hunted the afternoon. All I seen was a doe and a fawn and two coyotes, mm. but I wasn't uh, expecting to see a whole lot, so uh, when I got done with the hunt, I headed home. All right, so you only hunted then Friday night opening day then in, in Iowa. Right, just one hunt. All right, so tell us a little bit about what you uh, – um, are you, do you have your stands in place on this one farm or are you kind of going to wait and see what trail camera data shows up here before you, uh, go, go all in? What's the, what's the plan moving forward? Well, on uh, this one farm, I've got four stands in place right now and, and I got the tree picked out for another one and I'll be, I'll probably put a couple more up as I observe. But there's a lot of deer on this farm. Um, you can just, the soybean fields are just browse. You can walk through the middle of the soybean field, not even be on the edge, and you can see all kinds of, of browse pressure. And uh, the trail cameras, I've got, uh, what do I got, three three cell cameras on the farm. And I'm just getting hundreds of pictures a day of does and young bucks. So it's in a great area. I just got to believe there's going to be a good buck on that property at some time with all the does that are there. So I feel I'm in pretty good shape. It's just a matter of uh, letting things heat up a little bit for the rut. And getting Watch. a little closer to November. So Watching those roy their fronts a little bit. It, exactly. There's uh, All the crops are standing on this farm, but uh, the uh, farmer that's allowed me to hunt thought that in about 10 days or so, uh, the, the soybeans would be out, and he's going to call me when the soybeans come out. That'll really allow me to get around on that farm a whole lot better and uh once the bean soybeans are out the first cold front after that i'm headed back and i'm going to take a couple stands with me and get that last one up and then just have a spare you know based on observations if i uh, you know see some deer movement i need to capitalize on i want to have one of those lone wolf stands in my truck ready to roll yeah we talked about that a little bit um as we were chatting over the last couple of weeks about our plans with you going to Iowa and me coming to Illinois, I, I really hate burning vacation time for October hunts unless there's just something that I think I can get done um, unless I see that huge weather front. 
um, just to block out a time like you would in the rut when I take, you know, scheduled time off in November, I have a really hard time just coming to uh, Illinois and hunting. And I, I think you're kind of going along that game, same game plan too. It's when you see that weather front, that's when we, we uh, invest a little bit of time and run out there. Right. You know, the good thing is I can get up in the morning, check the weather. And if things look favorable, I can be in Iowa on this farm hunting that afternoon. Yeah, it's only about a three and a half hour drive. So, uh, I think um, it's about it's not like I'm driving. Yeah, I think it's about the same drive for you to get there as it is for me to come to you. Yeah, that, that's a lot better than, and that's the reason I selected this zone in Iowa. Is just I, I know I can spend a lot more time there, and and uh, I had some you know properties available to me in Western Iowa, but it was over a seven hour drive to get there. So no doubt I would not be able to go as often. And I, I certainly couldn't get there the same day and, and be in a stand later that day. And uh, unless I got up really early. So, uh, there was a, you know, a little bit of strategy behind picking Eastern Iowa over Western. Well, there's, there's another reason that you came back home and didn't stay in Iowa. And I guess, uh, it, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if it's uh I should say it's a proud moment or just a uh, uh a moment where you realize a lot of prayer and a lot of effort has kind of come together um and reality's kind of setting in a little bit for the reason that you, one of the reasons you came back from Iowa. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the uh there's a little bit of a weather front uh, coming through this our area this week and uh you know, the, the winner of the Lester's Feet raffle was Jay Ramsey, who was going to come hunt on my farm. Well, Jay asked me if I, I would allow his son, uh, Brant, to come and, and take his place. And, of course, that was fine with me. And I, I want to make sure this young man kills a deer and a nice buck. So uh, I, I want to start right out of the gate when I think there's an opportunity and get him here on the farm and, and get to hunting. And he only lives about three hours or so from me in Southern Illinois. So, uh, he's actually here right now. We hunted this evening for the first hunt and then he's going to stay for a couple of days. And, uh, if we don't get it done, he'll just keep coming back till we do get it done. Yep. But, uh, you know, actually Brand is on the phone here. So, uh, maybe you got a question or two for him about tonight's hunt. Well, Brent, um, I know that this is uh, probably exciting to you. Uh, why, don't you why don't you tell the listeners uh, we don't usually have many guests on. You're in you're in very high regard of the uh, the guests that we have on this podcast, but it's it's really cool to see um, hunters or families that that gave up and sacrificed money that they could have done for something else to buy tickets to support these families. Now you're getting to sit uh, and hunt with Don. Tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of where you're from. Well, I'm from southern Illinois. I just live on a farm and not much to me, I guess. But we Dad donated to that Lester's feed. I actually didn't know about uh Well, he told me about the podcast. I hadn't actually listened to it. And then he, he donated Lester's feed. He won that raffle. And that, I guess I'm a can't can't say i'm a super fan i started listening after but well i guess i'm a super fan since then i listened to just about everything every episode but well, had we you, were happy had you heard of don before your dad came to you and say you want to hunt yeah yeah okay so dad had actually been mostly from dad he'd been talking about it all the time just constantly so when uh, when you found out that you were going to hunt the same farm that's produced two 200-inch deer and a lot of other giants, what what did you think? I barely could believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you, you and your dad, or at least your dad, came up in, was it late August or September to meet Don? Was that right, Don? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Brandon came along too. Yeah, so you, you had already been up to the property and kind of seen Don. I think he probably drove you around a little bit. Um, when you see it in person, it, it kind of puts in perspective, kind of the Graceland for deer hunters, doesn't it? Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's, you talk about real world killing deer. It's, it's, it's a, an amazing property and it looks like something that could be done. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the biggest thing that, that I take away every time I'm on Don's place 
and you're going to see over the next couple of days, I think uh, you're going to see – what wind did you have tonight, Brent? Northwest. And so you ha- and you're going to maybe have a northwest wind tomorrow. Then it's going to switch. The biggest takeaway you're going to learn from uh, even being on that property during hunting season is how Don has access to every single one of his stands that's bulletproof to get in and out during no matter what the wind is. And and that's what that's one of the things probably the biggest in my opinion that makes that property so special is it doesn't matter what wind it is he can get to different areas of that farm with just bulletproof access and not have to jeopardize, you know, putting intrusion on bedding areas or or getting the wind going the wrong direction. So I'm excited for you. Thank you. So what's the biggest buck you've killed so far? (laughs) Oh, I guess not big enough to try to score. Just basket rack eight point. So what's your year and a half old probably? So Don Don's always about. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. It's part of being on the podcast. Don's <laughs> Don's always about setting a goal and and trying to trying to stay firm with what, that goal. What's your goal for hunting Don's property? Uh, probably the same as when I found out out about it and found out about a little bit more about Don and then kill to kill something that's three and a half years old would be. For for me, that's all. That's the only goal I'd really have. But because that's something that I haven't ever done, haven't ever really thought of doing. Yeah. So you're wanting to go after age structure. I think that's the that's the perfect angle to go. And your position is is to get a uh, an older buck. And uh, you know, not only are you helping uh, Don out with with maybe a call, but uh, I'm guessing there's a good chance you might even see a a, a a buck that's on the do not shoot list that you're going to, your mouth is going to maybe drop down. There's, there's always the chance of that. Well, one thing I'll throw out there, Terry, is that I'm not holding anything back on this hunt. I mean, I want the next Lester's feet raffle to be even bigger than the last one. And so I'm going to do everything in my power to get brand a good buck. And tomorrow morning, you know, I typically don't even hunt October mornings, but, uh, you know, having a guest here and wanting to make the best use of his time, we're going to hunt tomorrow morning and we're going to go to the stand where I shot Mel last year. Wow. So I just want all the listeners to know that if you win next year, there's no <laughs> holding back. When you're here, we're going to get you a deer, no matter what stand we got to go to to do it. Yep. And it's the same thing. Of the, the hunter that came and hunted with me in Kentucky, we weren't able to close the deal. We saw a shooter. He was just out of range. So we're going to try to get him back in late season. So, we're doing what we can. There's there was a lot of people that invested money um, that's going to help these families, and uh, I know you're the one that gets to benefit. You know, sleeping there at Don's uh, property there in the shed, and uh, and and getting to hunt with Don, and that's really cool. But in the big in the big scheme of things, there's basically just think of it that there's a kid sick that we're helping their family take care of that child because of all of this and that's that's really what hits home to me it's pretty special absolutely that's what that's what it's all about there is uh giving back you know there's the world is full of givers and takers and we try to be givers well brant i only got one piece of advice for you buddy all right you ready for this Yep. Before you go to sleep tonight, walk out the door and go unplug Don's air compressor because when that thing kicks on in the middle of the night about two feet from your head on the other side of the wall, you'll stand straight up in that bed. <laughs> <laughs> I've already unplugged it for the podcast, Terry, so we're good. <laughs> that same air compressor's made a couple guest appearances on the podcast before, So, uh, but I can tell you when that thing cuts on in the middle of the night and you're – you're excited about hunting the next morning and had had not gotten to bed when you should have anyway and that thing cuts on it'll make you stand straight up in that bed so well brant why don't i tell you what you're you're up there and why don't uh you hang on because because you get to be part of this um the podcast itself and uh instead of just listening uh to don talk there not know what's going on why don't you just stay on the line with us as we go through the rest of it is that okay with you absolutely well don uh as we've as we've watched social media the last week 
uh, there's been some big ones killed. We talked about Brandon Beachy's big buck in southern Kentucky last week. There was another giant that fell. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about Amos's buck? Yeah, I uh, got a message from Amos Hershberger, uh, one of my consulting clients. Actually, I've been to multiple properties for Amos. Um, he's been to the master class, just a super good guy. And I think he became a believer. The first property I did for him, I know I was there in the winter, of course, but that next summer, um, him and his son slipped out to an alfalfa patch that we, I had him put in and, uh, they slipped up over the hill to this alfalfa field. And he said there was at least 40 bucks that evening feeding in that alfalfa. (laughs) Goodness. And he had a sight he'd never seen before in his life, and he instantly became a believer. And, you know, this week I got the, the text and some, some photos from Amos of a buck he had just shot, and it's one of the coolest, most unique bucks I think I've ever seen in my life. And I think a lot of the people that follow me on social media have seen that photo, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, anyway, I just uh, want to congratulate Amos and something else I want to throw out there. I know a lot of my consulting clients listen to this podcast. And, um, uh, last week we had Brandon Beachy. We talked about Brandon Beachy's buck from Kentucky that you just mentioned. He was a consulting client. And this week, you know, Amos Hershberger killed a giant in Ohio. Both of these guys have stayed in contact with me after my visit there. And both of these guys followed my plan as closely as they could to the letter. They didn't deviate from it. And I have no doubt, I've seen it year after year, these guys that, that continue to, uh, or, or that stick to the plan, they continue to stay in contact with me. Those are the guys year after year that are killing the, the best bucks. And, you know, I know sometimes I'll go to a, a property and I'll meet with a client and I, I just, I can read the guy's mind. He, he just, he can't believe that this plan is going to produce and, and you just, you never hear from the client again. And I, I just encourage anybody that's listening that's had me to their property and I put a plan together for you, give it a chance. Don't deviate from it. Don't get on the internet and listen to a bunch of garbage. Garbage. And deviate from the plan. Garbage. <laughs> Stick with it. Give it a chance. <laughs> give it, give it three to five years and see what happens. And, uh, I think you'll be real happy if you do. Uh, you're talking about two different guys that killed world-class animals. So, um, but I think the world of Amos, just such a great guy. Um, um, always a pleasure to get to chat with him, but, um, um, can't be more happy for him. He's, he, he, he's put in a lot of work too. Not only did he get, you know, you to come out, out to uh, consult for him, but you know, he put in a lot of work on that property. Yeah. He's one of them guys that's worked hard all his life. He's built a business. He got to the point through hard work where he was able to afford a hunting property. And then when he did, he he made the most of it. And it paid off this week with a world-class buck. And and I'll tell you what, I just love getting those kind of texts and phone calls. Um, When you help somebody make a dream come true, um, that's pretty gratifying. Well, congratulations, Amos. Um, I tell you what, while we're talking about Brandon, uh, why don't you uh, – give the official news of what we're going to do with Brandon here in a couple months. Yeah. Brandon Beachy is a real world dealer down in Guthrie, Kentucky, which is right on the Tennessee line. But, uh, you and I are going to go down December 10th at, uh, Brandon's, um, place of business. And we're going to do a live podcast recording right there. It's on a Friday evening. So if you're close to Guthrie, Kentucky, um, be nice for you to come out and, uh, you know, meet Terry and I, if you got questions, we're going to take questions right there on the podcast. And, uh, I'm sure Brandon was going to have some show, some specials, um, for real world products. He also sells hunting blinds and feeders and, and just a lot of different, uh, you know, hunting items. So be a good time Friday evening, kick your weekend off December 10th. Um, We'll announce more details as time gets closer, but giving everybody a chance to get it on their calendar now. Well, I know that I know that we've already gotten a couple requests, and we because it's Brandon and our relationship with Brandon, we went ahead and said yes um, 
for his event. Um, we want to support him being a real world dealer, obviously, but you know, he's a good friend of ours. But outside of that, we've already started getting a lot of requests for us to make appearances at trade shows. Let me rephrase that for you to make appearances at trade shows and me to haul your luggage around. That's about what my role (laughs) in this thing is, is to carry your bag. But, um, but the bottom line is, We'll try to support as much of that stuff as we can, whether it's a church event, whether it's a, um, a live podcast, whether it's a, a trade show. If Don can make it work and uh, schedule his consulting to be in that area, um, as you as you know, Don, you know all these requests comes in, but your schedule gets booked way way in advance. I think you you basically were booked up with consulting for the whole year by the end of December last year, which was the first time it ever happened. So if there's church groups or anything else that want Dawn and possibly I to be there to help support it from Chasing Giants, from Real World, from Lester's Feet, please let us know as early as possible what you're thinking. That way we can kind of combine trips uh, this winter and early spring, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've already got a schedule that's just chock full. I mean, there's six weekends in a row starting in late February through the month of March where I've got something going every weekend. And, uh, I know for a fact, I'm going to be traveling to uh, North Carolina. I'm going to be speaking at the Dixie deer classic. I'm going to be speaking at a show in Chipchawana, Indiana. Um, I think that one's in January. Uh, I'm going to be speaking at the Illinois deer classic. Uh, I believe that one's the first weekend in March. Um, but, but just to getting a full calendar uh, and I've already got a long list of consulting jobs for this winter, probably 50, um, or so. So, uh, my calendar is getting full, but we'll do the best that we can. And if we can work it into our travels, um, you know, that'd be, that, that's basically the only way we're going to be able to do it. Yeah. Cause a lot of these, uh, you know, like wild game dinners or church events or something like that might be in the evenings where if we can schedule you to be at a consulting visit in that area, we can we can do it a whole lot easier. So if you guys are thinking about having Dawn or I um, this coming year, please let us know. We'll uh, possibly give you some windows to do that. Um, I'm excited to switch gears a little bit, Dawn. I'm excited about a new series of social media posts that you're making. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It was kind of like the ones that got away. Um, I don't think anyone has a true appreciation for how many bucks you watch and the small few that you actually decide to hunt. And uh, this gives a little bit of insight to that. Yeah, I I started this because uh, it seems like I was talking to somebody the other day and and they they made it sound simpler than it is. Like I, I just find a buck and I start watching that buck through trail camera photos or whatever. And then, uh, I let him get old enough and then boom, I go out and I kill him. Well, in, in a nutshell, that's kind of how it works. But what everybody misses is that I watch a heck of a lot of bucks that get killed or disappear long before I ever get to hunt them. And so what I've started doing is sharing some photos of, you know, some different bucks that I thought had a world of potential to be really special if they got a little older and they disappeared. Now, some of them I know were shot by neighbors or whatever. and and I'm not, you know, trying to get the neighbors to, you know, follow my management plan or anything like that or dictate what somebody else shoots. Um, everybody shoot what you want. But I just, I wanted to share this so that people understood that it's not as easy as it might look from the outside. There's a whole lot of bucks get away without ever me ever hunting them than get killed. Well, there's a couple takeaways I have, and we d- I didn't even know you were going to start this series on social media, but the cool thing about it is is when we talk to people in our just normal travels, one of the common things that I hear all the time is, I could never do that on my property because the neighbors would shoot him. So I'm going to, basically you're implying the neighbors are going to shoot him, so I might as well. And I think one of the things that you're going to see in some of this uh, um, this series of posts from Don is, yeah, there's there's bucks that you lose to the neighbor shooting, and that's part of it. That's part of hunting wild deer. But if you shoot him, he doesn't have any chance. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Yep. Don't be that neighbor. <laughs> I mean, when you shoot him, you are the neighbor. What's what's the neighbor saying about you? I can't let him go because that guy's always shooting him. Yeah. So uh, it's got to start somewhere. I think it goes back a lot to you have to. We've we've talked over and over about this. Is you know you have to evaluate where you are with your journey, set your goals, just like we talked about with Brant. You know he's he's at a different place than some listeners, and and some listeners might be in the exact same place he's at. But you uh, you have to evaluate where you're at, set your goals, and and kind of stay within that pathway. And that's going to be different from person to person. But um, I think what your your message is going to be time after time. I don't know how many bucks you're going to share in this series, but um, you know there's there's still an awful lot of deer that you identify and start watching that you never get a chance to hunt. So it's not like you have something different than everyone else's situation. And that's kind of my message, Terry, is that, you know, I, I, I fully believe, I say this all the time, but I really believe it. Anybody could do what I'm doing if you put the, they put the effort in. And uh, I don't think that people understand the effort that it takes to, to chase these kind of deer and kill them consistently. And, you know, you don't go out and just find one buck and boom, there you go. You kill him this year, then you go find another one, you kill him the next year. It's like you go out and you find 10, 15, 20 of them to watch at a time. And if you're lucky, you get to hunt one or two of them. So, you know, this is as real world as it gets. And, you know, that's what I think a lot of the people that come to the master course, they take away is that, you know, this is not a big property. Yeah, it lays out really well. Um, but if I can do it here, you know, there's a lot of other properties across the country that, that could do everything that I'm doing here and more. And we're talking about bucks on your home farm. This isn't, this is, this is everywhere. So your home farm isn't immune to this. Um, off, yeah. the, off the top of my head, there was a buck maybe three years ago. You videoed, I believe, late October. Maybe it was even Halloween night that you told me that I had the green light on. Just a bruiser of a body, um, huge mass, had kickers on his G2, I believe. You yep. F- actually, you filmed him down where, where Brand, Brant hunted tonight. Um, right. And uh, and let him walk, and I was coming in to hunt him and, and come to find out. I was going to hunt him late season and come to find out the neighbor shot him, I believe, during shotgun, right? And they did, and, and uh, he was shot at a full three miles off of my farm. So, you know, people get the idea that I've got a special farm, and I do, but that don't mean bucks don't leave and neighbors don't shoot them because it, I guarantee you they do. And just to be clear, these photos of these bucks that I'm sharing, some of them are here on my farm or were here on my farm. And, uh, you know, some of them are on other properties I hunt, but every one of them are, are dead to this today, as far as I know. I, I've got away from sharing current pictures. Um, there's just a handful of local people that not even a handful i could probably count them on one hand that that go to my social media and and just you know they they lurk in the shadows just you know looking for current information that they can somehow use to to jump a claim or whatever however you want to put it you know instead of doing their own scouting they like to do their scouting on my social media page so i really got away from posting current pictures um, for the most part and these pictures that I'm posting are all from, some of them are from 10 years ago. All right. Well, uh, before we move to the next uh, talking point, Don, I don't know if it's you or me, but I haven't lost you yet, but the audio quality was jumping a little bit. So if you're sitting somewhere in the shed and, and, and Brant's muted, why don't you slide over closer to the door just in case it's on your side. I moved my phone. I don't want to give up a lot of audio quality as we get up through the rest of the um the rest of the podcast. So, um, I I got a very interesting comment, um, about the upcoming master classes next week. And it has to do with a conversation I had. What is today? Sunday. It has to do with a conversation I had yesterday with a young man. So why don't, why don't you talk a little bit of a reminder about the upcoming master classes and the, um, addition of Dr. Bronson Strickland. And then I got a, a comment after you get done. Well, I just want to remind everyone that the master classes are in March every year. This year, on the 10th and 12th of March, uh, Dr. Bronson Strickland from the MSU Deer Lab is going to 
going to be part of it. He's got a presentation that he's going to do during uh, those two classes. And then uh, there's four more on March 17th, 19th, 24th, and 26th. So uh, if anybody's interested, uh, just reach out to me and I, I can give you the details. You can also just go to my website, HigginsOutdoors.com or ChasingGiants.com. And you can find a lot more details on the Whitetail Master Course. Yeah, and uh, for the, our friends listening on MTech, our Amish friends, um, uh, you can contact Don via phone. Um, I assume that uh, we'll see a little bit more of details published as we get closer, but don't wait on this. Um, I had the opportunity to ride in the truck uh, yesterday with a young man who uh, had gone in and um, enlisted into the Marine Corps to serve our country. And he had a, I don't, <laughs> it's typical one of these things we talk about the government screwing up, but uh, he had a situation where he was in basic training. Uh, I'm not sure how far into basic training he had gone, but I guess they had done some health screenings or something. And he ended up testing positive for, I can't remember what it was. It was like hepatitis B or something. And uh, ended up getting a medical discharge from it. And he's like, this is crazy. How could I have this, you know? And uh, came home, saw some specialists. Well, ended up they got the testing uh, results wrong. So they don't know whether the test was bad or they got the uh, the guys in basic training, they got their files <laughs> mixed up. But anyway, this kid got died false positive on hepatitis B and got discharged out of the Marine Corps. So he's uh, he's home and believe it or not, he wants to go back and still serve. He's going to start basic training all the way over again in order to go back and serve this country. So real good kid, a graduate of our local high school, comes from a very good family. But in the meantime, uh, he's helping out our local school system as a substitute teacher and stuff like that. So he rode up to the kids' band competition with me yesterday so he didn't have to ride the bus. And uh, he jumped up in the truck, and we're driving, and – he says, I just got one question. How do you, he goes, how do you, how do you kill a big buck every year? And it, I don't know if you've ever had that, that, uh, situation happened on, but you kind of answer something and then you think about what you said versus think about what you're going to say and then say it. Yeah. And, and the answer that came out of my mouth is, um, you got to learn how to kill a mature buck before you kill a giant buck. And we've talked about that a little bit on the podcast. And what this master class to me is about is there's nobody out there, and I'm not just stroking you, Don, that can lay out what a mature buck thinks and how that changes as he gets older than what you lay out in this master class. So whether that buck is a six-year-old 135 inch toad or he's a 190 inch deer he's still a six and a half year old that thinks differently and the information that you share in your master class to lay out what that deer's thinking where you need to be and how to set that up is like nothing else I've ever been part of and it's helped me in my career drastically then there's another element now that I know or I figure out or I'm trying to learn how to kill a mature buck how do I grow giant deer? What kind of habitat things can I do? What kind of management practices can I put in place? What kind of nutrition can I put in place? And this is the guy that's probably one of the most renowned people in that research. And having you two at the same spot, basically giving up uh, you know, key insights that can only be found at that event – it's something special when you really look at it. And I told this kid, I was like, you know, that's really the nature of what this master class that Don's putting on with him and Dr. Strickland is you have one of the best guys that can teach you what a mature buck thinks and how to hunt him. You know, things that things that Al Foster was teaching you all the way back in the day was you were getting started. And then you got this guy, Dr. Strickland, who's coming in from, uh, you know, his background of what to do from not only management culling and nutrition uh just just an awesome awesome event to to get both sides of it i think it's going to be fantastic well i hope so i can tell you that uh, there's already been several people sign up for those two classes with dr Strickland. those two are going to be the first ones that sell out no doubt about it and uh you know 
to kind of build on your comments there, Terry, a, a mature buck is a mature buck, and what he has on his head doesn't make him any smarter. And I, I've said it before, but Smokey, the 206-inch buck that I shot in, back in 17, he uh, was probably the easiest mature buck that I've ever ever hunted and ever killed. And yet he was also one of the biggest. So, you know, you can't just look at a buck and he's got a giant rack and he's mature. So he's smarter than another buck that's the same age, but doesn't have the rack. But there's just no correlation with, you know, how smart they are. They're all smart when they get that age, but uh, there's just no correlation with rack size. Well, as we were driving up the interstate, I was looking at my... Uh... I was in uh, Chris Yates from Victory Chevrolet would be proud of me. I was using the dash and the screen on the dash as a as a visual for what a, a bedding area would look like, and was and was explaining to them the infamous J hook, which is a technique and a and a topic that you teach in your master class. So anyway, this young man that's going to be going back into the military and going through basic training the second time, I think his head was spinning by the end of the truck the the trip up the interstate so uh but anyway i told him i said i'm going to use this as an example on the podcast this week so i appreciate that young man's service and being willing to go back and i can't imagine going through boot camp one time much less having to go back and do it almost uh, twice uh because of a screw up by the government so I want to keep him in our prayers and thank him for his service so um yeah for sure. we, we appreciate it all right, so that's coming up. Uh, before we move on to the buy farm segment, do you have a best and worst you want to talk about this week? I do, and before I do it, though, Terry, I think uh, I'd like to announce that this is going to be my last best and worst. And the reason for it is I start getting on the, I start looking for the best and worst, and it, it leads me to to politics and religion just about all the time. And I've almost I have quit watching TV almost entirely. I've definitely quit watching the news just because, uh, well, for one thing, you can't trust it for, for the most part. <laughs> it's all political. And uh, I, I start looking for these best and worst, and I get all fired up and mad. <laughs> and uh, I think, well, this will be our last one. <laughs> well, we're, we're into hunting season, so we're going to be spending more time talking about what you see in the woods every night. So that's okay. Yep. So with that said, I did find the best and worst this week. The best thing I see, and I'll tell you what, I just, these professional, I shouldn't say athletes, it's, it's the organizations like the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, they become a bunch of political megaphones, if you will, um, for the wrong side. And especially the NBA and the NFL, in my opinion, that, you know, I, and I realize that there are some very patriotic players, football, basketball, whatever. But one of the best things I've seen this week was some NBA players standing up to the NBA against their COVID vaccine mandate. And uh, these guys put some very intelligent uh, arguments out there. I mean, they got, you know, up there in front of the microphone with the press grilling them. And uh, some of these guys put, I was just real impressed, um, you know, with the speeches they made stating their case and, and why they they feel they should not be forced to take that vaccine. So that that was the best thing I've seen this week. Huh. For you to take up for NBA players, you know, it must have been pretty good. Well, uh, I, I'm taking <laughs> up for, for these particular players, not the in the NBA. <laughs> Um, See, I'd just, I'd just be so jaded I would say that they don't want to take it because it would mess up how much my marijuana they can smoke and get away with not getting caught in a drug <laughs> test or something. But that's <laughs> that's just my jaded side of it that ruins your moment. So, Well, you, you might like my worst. <laughs> All right, um, let's hear it. My worst thing I found was the continual politic, politicization of COVID. Um. I, I, I've listened to, I, I get people sending me, I guess they think I'm a radical. So they send me all these links to different videos and such, um, basically supporting my side or somebody's trying to convince me I'm wrong. So they'll send me a video promoting the other side of these arguments. And uh, I've seen something very, very interesting. And, and 
and I just seen it a couple of days ago, and it was on a video that was sent to me, but it looked at the death rate across the entire world. How, how many people are alive in the world and how many people died in, in each year for the last six years and what the, the per death rate percentage was of the population. And, and you know it has not changed a fraction in the last six years. It's always been, for the last six years, it's either 0.76% of the population dies each year or 0.75. 0.76 or 0.75. And it did not change last year with COVID whatsoever, not an iota. It was 0.76% of the population died. This COVID is nothing but a political thing. And, I mean, you got to have your head buried in the sand or right up Joe Biden's rectum if you can't see it. <laughs> I, ho- I hope somebody's head's not up Joe Biden's rectum because he'll end up falling and you'll get squashed. Well, he wouldn't know it if it was, so we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think with that, we'll move on to the Buy Farm segment for the week. How about that? Probably better. Buyafarm.com is your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. Now, here is Don Higgins with this week's featured property. Okay, this week's featured property is 80 acres in White County, Illinois. It's actually an online auction. Um, That auction closes Thursday, November 11th, so uh, we've got a month or so here. Um, You really ought to take a look at this one. It uh, it lays out fantastic. If you look at the, the aerial, there's a uh, some drone footage on the biofarm.com website, and the property is broken up really well. There's a number of ponds on it. Um, it's only four miles east of Norris City, Illinois. Um, it's an old livestock farm, I guess. It uh, looks like a lot of pasture ground, and uh, there's an older barn. And uh, there's an older home, but it says that the home has no value, but it'd be a good place to, to build a new home. Um, you could raise livestock there, but the, the potential I see is as a whitetail hunting property because that rolling pasture would just be perfect to put into CRP and plant switchgrass and uh, have, have some great bedding cover. And um, White County is actually a very good county in Illinois. It's on the eastern side of the state. Um, this property is only like an hour and a half from Paducah, Kentucky, and less than an hour from Evansville, Indiana. Um, 18 minutes from Carmi, Illinois. Carmi is a fairly sizable town in southern Illinois. 32 minutes to Harrisburg, which is another sizable uh, town in southern Illinois. And the taxes on the place are less than $1,000 a year, $962 to be exact. But if you've got any interest, uh, I suggest you go to the Buy a Farm website look for the online auction for 80 acres in white county or call agent wayne keller Uh, wayne's phone number is 618-407-1679 and while we're on this section terry i want to throw out something to the listeners uh you know last week uh we featured a property and i heard from uh it was actually a property i know the, the seller of the property uh, he was actually in my high school class, and uh, he asked me about the about listing that property, and I put him in contact with a different biofarm agent who was closer and, and uh, could do a better job for him. Well, we featured that on the last week's podcast, and on Monday when that podcast came out, uh, a bunch there was a lot of interest in it, and all these listeners were calling the, the real estate agent, and they got in a bidding war, and uh, he actually got more than asking price as these people were bidding on that uh, property we featured last week. So if there's any interest in these properties that we're talking about, uh, you need to to move right away because there's a lot of people hearing this. Well, um, you know, not just for buy a farm, but I think there's two elements that come into play here. Number one, we're not selling out and just talking about junk or garbage. um, if, If it's not something we believe in, and number two, I think that our listeners really are searching for an unbiased, uh, you know, insight to so, to so much marketing gimmicks that's out there. So whether it's the biofarm segment or us talking about a product that's not even 
you know, sponsored by the show. Um, we don't mind bringing that to you, but it's it's pretty cool to see you all go out and uh, um, and and believe in us enough that you 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 would go out and purchase the product. You know, we got a we got a message this week. Don talked about the new backpack from Osseo that uh, he invested in. Um, you know, I bought some stuff from him first and was starting to use it and then did a review video on kind of what's important to me about it, especially as a tree stand whitetail hunter. And I think Don kind of saw some of that stuff and he went and bought one. Well, after we talked about it on the on the podcast last week, they actually contacted us and said, what's up? You know, we sold a lot of backpacks all of a sudden that, uh, that they didn't see coming. And we've seen the same thing with our friends from uh, – extreme custom blowers or whatever so um uh, we I, we do appreciate the response to us trying to really protect the integrity of this podcast and not just you know represent some junk because you know somebody wants to pay us to talk about it so it means a lot to us that's right terry for sure well said so uh you know we we did just talk about a little bit uh, i gotta tell a quick story don you, you, you talked about Joe Biden's rectum a minute ago. I can't let you get away with that. <laughs> as soon as <laughs> we, we Don't just. Tell me you need to wipe your forehead off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> Boy, that wasn't scripted. I can tell you that. <laughs> we were just got done talking about how. Let us know if you want us to come to your church group. <laughs> to speak and then you start talking about joe biden's rectum well i I gotta tell i gotta tell the listeners a quick story i don't know how many years ago it was i did a charity event to raise money to build some houses in haiti uh and we had this hunters helping haiti event here in kentucky and don drove down from illinois i think it was it was either in February or March because you gave up going to the Iowa Deer Classic to come to that. It ended up being the same weekend, but uh, <laughs> it was it was uh, 2018 because it was the year after you shot Smokey and Trump because you brought both of those deer, if, if if I remember right, right? Um, no, because Obama was in office in 17. Trump was in office. Yeah. But the the one thing you kept saying every every time you talked, you kept saying Obama sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and I said I said you cannot get up in front of this church group and say Obama sucks. And everything was going to plan till all of a sudden the projector screwed up and it locks up and Don's sitting in front of about three hundred and fifty people waiting for the slide presentation to to get back because they had the computer locked up. And Don looks over to me and says, well, Terry, this is just a, it's a message from God. He gave me this opportunity to say Obama sucks. <laughs> and right then the computer starts working and it goes onto the slide. So, um, but anyway, I just thought that was funny. He started talking about Biden's rectum right after we got done talking about coming to church groups. So that reminded me of a pretty well, funny story. I think we made it, we made it pretty clear a couple of weeks ago that, uh, you know, you and I are both Christian guys, but we're not the example to follow. Um, Christ is the example to follow. Um, Terry and I do our best, but we got a long way to go before we're Christ like. Yeah. We're working on it. We're we're getting a little better each day. We try, but uh, uh, we got to get off of these best and worst because it just brings politics into it, Terry. Well, you we, know uh, me. I just can't hold back. We got some really <laughs> good. We got a lot of likes and shares and comments from a social media post on the real world site today i thought was pretty cool because you know yeah I, I shared that one too that was a good one you know we talk about people wanting to be sponsored and everything and the communion meditation at church today was talking about the ultimate sponsor that uh my friend brian simpson did and you know he paid the big price so it's a matter of what you're going to do you don't have to you don't have to uh to uh, tag or like him you just have to accept it you know, it's it's not about looking for recognition when you're talking about his salvation. He gave it to all of us, no matter what the situation is. So, well, with that, yep. why don't we move on to the listener submitted questions for the week? All righty. The first question this week comes from Gary 
Laseco from Easton, Maryland. Gary says, Don and Terry, I often find myself looking back on a particular big buck that I did not end up killing. The time spent chasing after, thinking about, and learning from my failures pursuing that buck have made me a much better hunter. Are there any specific big bucks that have gotten away from you for one reason or another that have made you a better hunter or been a turning point in your hunting career? If so, what is there your story? Thanks and keep up the great work. Gary. Um, well, Gary, um, there is one buck that will haunt me forever. <laughs> and I, I can't say it was actually a turning point, but it's one buck that I will never forget. And I'd seen the buck the year before. It was uh, it was the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and I was in a tree stand. I'm talking. This is about uh, this is probably 30 years ago. It was the Sunday after Thanksgiving. I'd been on a month long vacation for my job. I had to go back to work the next day. It was my last hunt before I had to return from a month long vacation. And gun season, that was the weekend before here in Illinois. And so, you know, deer were back in those days. I didn't know enough, but bucks were hard to come by after gun season. And I'm sitting in my stand, and somebody had apparently had bumped this buck out of some covers. Small game hunters, or I don't know what, what, what it was, but something bumped this buck out of cover like a mile and a half away across wide open ag fields. And I'm sitting in my stand, and here comes this buck across. And uh, he never got close enough for a shot, but he got within about 50 or 60 yards going past me into the cover. And I'm telling you what, this thing was an absolute giant, just a super wide, super tall, clean pinpointer. But, I mean, he was he was a giant. His, his frame was every bit as big or bigger than Smokey and Mel. Just huge. and. Last that was the last I ever saw him. This was before the days of trail cameras or anything. And I never saw saw him again that season. But the next season, you know, I was hunting in that same area. And a friend of mine had seen this buck from the road and he described it. And, and I mean it was the same deer. It had to be the same deer. It's just way too big. There, there couldn't have been two of them like that. And he described it. But anyway, I'm sitting in my stand one evening and uh I had some does feeding you know, passed me, uh, went out into a bean stubble field, their feet, and, and they came out of this thicket. And a, a buck comes out of the thicket behind them. He's, you know, checking them out. He's, I don't remember, he was a two and a half, three and a half year old. He was out of range uh, of me, or I, back then I'd have probably shot him. And he goes out in the field, and he's chasing these does around, grunting and stuff. And I, I hear more, you know, brush moving breaking leaves rattling whatever in in the thicket and it's starting to get dark and I, i'm just straining my eyes i'm straining my eyes and finally there was a creek between where i was at in this thicket so the deer had to come out of that thicket down across the creek come up into a little bit of a narrow stretch of, of open woods and then into the ag field and uh you know i see i catch a glimpse of this deer going down into the creek from the real thick stuff and when he comes out, it's like, oh, my God, it's that giant from the year before. And I'm telling you what, this deer, I'm, he, he was a 200-inch typical if i ever seen one in my life. And he comes out, and he walks 20 yards from me, and he, he stops right at the edge of that field in that open timber and uh, gives me a shot. And, and I shoot, and, I, boy, I thought I drilled him. I mean, I, I heard that arrow crack, and. Thought I hit him in the shoulder, but back in those days, I was using the Rothar snuffer, a big old, I don't remember, I think it was 145 grain, it might have been 175 grain, but, uh, oh man, that deer took off, busted out of there, and I just knew he was on a death run. I came back a couple hours later with a friend and, and uh, some lights, and, and my arrow was laying there on the ground right where that buck had been whenever I shot. And it was pointed right back. The broadhead was pointed back to my stand. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I hit a twig and deflected the arrow and the arrow hit the buck sideways or what, but it broke one of the welds on the, the back of that uh, broadhead. And it, it had sprung aside. And, and when it sprung aside, it, it, it sprung back and there was deer hair caught under that busted weld. 
Mm. And uh, there was just a little bit of blood on the tip of that arrow. But that arrow was uh, pointed right back at the stand. And uh, I never did figure out what happened. I figure I deflected off a branch and then hit that deer in the shoulder uh, with the, the arrow going, you know, mostly sideways or something. But that deer will haunt me forever because I'm telling you what, frame-wise, that, that deer frame-wise was easily the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. Bigger than Smokey, bigger than Mel. He was just a clean 10-pointer, but, man, he was a giant. So so that's one story of one buck that, that I will never forget and that will haunt me forever. Very cool. I've never heard that story. That's pretty neat. Yeah, and, you know, the, here, here's another neat thing. The very next evening, this, the same friend that had seen that deer from the road and told me about him, he seen him from the road again the very following evening after I I shot and, you know, whatever happened, missed him, hit him, deflected, whatever. He seen that deer 24 hours later with a doe crossing the road. Wow. Yeah. We the, need, the we need thing a... that sticks with me is that I know if that happened today, if I, if I had a buck like that today, and I had permission on the properties I had back then in and, and that deer's range, I'd kill him. I, I guarantee you, I'd kill him. I'd put everything I had into it. I would kill him today, but that one got away from me. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things. I had an old ball coach one time that told me you learn more from striking out than you need to learn from hitting a home run. And uh, I think that's where uh, Gary's coming at from the question is, you know, um, some of the biggest disappointments – that we have as, as outdoorsmen can turn into some of the best lessons to make us better in, in the end. And I think we've all been there where we've made a shot and maybe we're a little bit luckier than what we should have been and end up getting the deer. I know I've been there, but the, uh, the ones that were a bad experience, boy, they put either a drive in you that's second to none, or they teach you a lesson that you might not have learned or took serious up until that point. So good question, Gary. We appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Um, now I got to relive all that, Gary. My heart's broken as I finish this podcast. <laughs> we all need a few more uh, two hundred inch typicals in our life. What do you say? <laughs> I'm telling you what, I could, this, this deer's rack is burned into my mind. I mean that that thing was ginormous. He only had ten points, but I'm telling you what, he's the biggest ten pointer on the planet. <laughs> wow. Well, now you got me fired up. Joe Joe Biden's wrecked him in the biggest deer I ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> next question. We better move on. Uh, next question comes from Seth Healy from Macedonia, Illinois. Seth's um, a good guy. Actually, no, Seth. Yep, Seth's Same years ago. Great Seth, guy. Seth's a good guy. Um, Seth says, Don, do you make all day sits during November? And if so, how do you mentally prepare yourself for sitting all day? Well, to be honest, Seth, I wish I could do more of it than I do. I'm lucky if I can do it once or twice a year. Um, I just, I guess I'm not patient enough. Um, I, I'm better than I used to be. And, uh, how do I mentally prepare myself? I've got to know that I'm in a great spot. If I'm in a, a spot where I, th- I think is good. Yeah. I can sit there till noon and, and then come back at two, but I need that little break in the middle of the day. If I'm sitting in a spot that I know is absolutely fantastic and I know without a doubt there's a giant in the area and I know without a doubt that he comes through that spot, I I can force myself to stay there all day. The other thing I do is I take a bunch of food with me (laughs) and uh, just little pieces of candy and I'll reward myself. Every 15 minutes, I get one little piece of candy (laughs) or something like that. And then... uh, you know, at 10 o'clock, I get a sandwich. At noon, I get a sandwich. At 2 o'clock, I get a sandwich. And I space it out, you know, and I reward myself every time I, I sit to the next goal um, with some food. So uh, it probably sounds crazy, but uh, that's kind of my trick for, for sitting all day. And pray you don't have a coat around. Jerry, I know you sit, more, you sit all day more than I do. Um, and a lot of that has to do with me hunting out of state. You know, if I come up to Illinois, you know, but when you really look at me being out, I'm probably at max three or four to times do I not come out of the woods. Uh, most of the time I'll come out. I mean, let's face it, um, when you're eating, um, 
on an out of state deer hunt, you eat a bunch of junk food and stuff that's not good for you, and then you eat really late when you come in and you're starving and have a big steak or something like that. And the the bathroom calls really really hard at around eleven or twelve o'clock that next <laughs> that next day. So um, yeah, I mean it's um, uh, probably three four times max is what I'll do. Yeah. Um, I'm more likely to actually sit during shotgun season more than anything else just because I want to be in the stand while everybody else is getting out, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And walking around. But there is a there is a piece of advice, you a tip you gave me that kind of applies to Seth's uh, question, and I'll, I'll tee it up and you can kind of go into it. It's when you go gangbusters and go crazy through the middle of October – he he mentions mentally by the time you get to the peak rut where you really need to be dialed in and and willing to get up and a lot of it's just being able to get up every morning if you're already burnt out by the time the rut comes you know you, you basically pushed yourself too hard to begin with because of the excitement of deer season you can talk about that a little bit more but you've talked about that several times in seminars that I've been at yeah um you know, one of the best times to kill a giant is Thanksgiving weekend. I, I say that every year. I just preach it year after year when we get, you know, into November. It's like people don't give up. Thanksgiving weekend is one of the best times of the entire year to kill giants. And uh, I'm telling you, by the time Thanksgiving rolls around, there's not very many deer hunters that aren't burnt out. And there's not very many guys that could go out Thanksgiving weekend and sit all day. But that is a fantastic time to kill a giant. So just a little piece of advice, but good question, Seth. But believe it or not, I don't do it a whole lot. So, yep. The code Brown always gets me. I was going to say code Brown has ruined a lot of all day sets. (laughs) No doubt about it. (laughs) All right. So we got one more question. This one comes from, I hope I say your name right. Nicholas Dawa from Lindsburg. Kansas. Um, Nicholas says, my question is about bucks using deer trails. I've recently been told that if you find a really big deer trail in the woods, it's usually used by multiple does and fawns. This seems to be true. Then I put my trail camera on a worn trail and check the pics. Is it true that bucks intentionally use their own trail and it's usually close to and parallel to these big doe trails? If so, why does this happen? Um, I don't know that bucks have their own trail. Um, I, I guess you could say they do, but a lot of times what a mature buck does is he uses terrain and wind. And I think we talked about this, um, a couple of weeks back where, you know, everybody wants to go to the woods and they want to hunt based on, uh, you know, deer sign and they, they go through the woods and they see deer trails and they think, well, that's the only place that deer move. Deer never get off these trails. And uh, when it comes to mature bucks specifically, or um, they just, the terrain dictates where they move. A lot of times they move through an area. I guess it was Al Foster and I this week was talking about this. We got a chance to uh, spend a few hours together this week uh, on a little trip, and uh, we were talking about this. But a mature buck, he, he goes through an area, and he's using the wind and the terrain to his advantage. And he's taking a lot fewer chances than the does and fawns do. And there's so fewer mature bucks as well, he's not going to beat down a path, or they're not going to beat down a path. So uh, the, the idea that they're using, um, they have their own trail, and it's downwind of the doe trail, and this and that, I don't know. That kind of strikes me as as king buck type material. <laughs> I was you know just I mean? thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's just I don't know. Somebody probably made that up, you know, to sell an article or whatever. It sounds good. Now I do think a lot of times when these mature bucks are traveling through, they are downwind of a lot of the cover um, where the the, the lesser deer are traveling, bedding, feeding, whatever. And what they're doing is that allows them to, to use their nose and scent check all that. 
So, but as far as having their own trails that are downwind, I mean, what does he have one on each side of the doe trail? So when the wind switches, he can go to the other side. I, I don't know. I think sometimes we, we overthink these things. King buck. <laughs> King buck. Oh boy. One of these days we'll, uh, we'll share the secret of the King buck. Well, we got a question the other day. Uh, did you see the question we got submitted? Uh-uh. It was about the King buck. Was it? Okay. I'm going to share that with you. It, it, it's a very, very long question. All right. Um, we might have to use that sometime. Yep. So anyway, uh, we'll save that for another day. I think everybody will get a kick out of that, but uh, there's just some really warped stuff out there. That's all I got to say. <laughs> so, well, um, I'm excited for your, for you to be able to hunt tomorrow. Brant, um, all I can say is, buddy, enjoy it. Uh, I know the, even still to this day, as many hours as I've sat in a stand at Don's place, uh, it's still kind of a special humbling uh, opportunity to be able to, to be able to get in a stand. And uh, all I can say is ask a lot of questions and uh, and be, uh, um, be all ears over the next couple of days. You're going to learn a lot. So we hope you kill a giant and, uh, and hope we get a Facebook post here in the next couple of days with you holding, holding a big rack. So, well, if he shoots one, uh, we'll have to have him on the podcast again next week and he can tell the story. But there you go. If we don't get it done this week, we're going to keep hitting it until it is done. So, uh, the winner of the Lester's feet, I'm telling you, I'm going all out. There's no, no standoff limits. We're going to get you a, a nice buck. For you to hunt mornings in October, the first week of October, you, you know, you're trying hard. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you what, as soon as brand has gone, I will not be out this morning in October, but just kind of trying to up the odds since he's here, well, give him the best chance possible. The places that you're going to be hunting with him over the next couple of days, you got bulletproof access to get in and out, so the the fear of hunting right. mornings, you can do that with a couple of your spots, especially with that wind. Right. So, all yeah. right, well, good luck to Brant, and uh, with that, why don't you take us out with our sponsors? All right, we want to thank uh, buyafarm.com, Victory Chevrolet, 360 Hunting Blinds, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Lone Wolf Tree Stands, wildlifefarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Stay safe out there, guys. See you next week. <laughs>